Hello, and welcome to the HNLMS Scorpion. Hmm. Or Scorpion. It's a very cool Dutch ship. And it's a former monitor built in, oh, well, laid down in 1867. Built in France. Her sister's built in Britain. They're an interesting class of vessel. Before I get into them, though, before I discuss them too much, I'm going to quickly do this, because currently at the moment, the 2023 Patreon vote for April is live. And I'm doing this now because it ends on Sunday. This is going out on Saturday. And on Monday, a vote is going to begin, which I'm going to explain, which is going to be for June's Patreon videos. So June's Patreon videos are going to be voted on this month. They're going to be suggested by your view. So the suggestions are going to go live for a week. And then it's going to be the, the vote for them. Now this is all going to be done because they need to be recorded before June. Because hopefully during June, if all the announcements go through fine and everything works, I am not going to be in my little office. So I'm going to need to record it something before I go away which means I have a lot of work to do in May. I'm going to be literally not leaving this office, I think, for most of May. Terrible for my fitness. Great for you guys. All of you. Lots and lots of stuff will be produced. Anyway, let's zoom in on this, because this was what I posted up a few days ago. And as you can see, what have we got votes? Well, we've got six for Carl on the flotillas of Danube. I'm wondering if that's going to end up being, ne uh, you know, the next equivalent of the Diesel Kriegsmarine. Carl just put it in so many times it gets through. But there again, there is also the 50 gun ship of the line. And at what point in the age of sail did the RN come closer to losing or actually lose naval superiority? You should find a link down below to vote if you want to go vote in the Patreon vote. And these, of course, are to, for this month's lives and Patreon recorded videos. I have a fluffy research assistant with me who is currently doing mild levels of um, biological <clears throat> warfare. Andrew Waite, uh, let's use hindsight design optimum naval strategy of the Royal Navy from 1945 onwards. That could be a fun one. Ugh, hello. Yes, hello. Right, so you're here. Hello. Yes, um, we now have Poodle. We now have Poodle. But as you can see, currently in the lead massively is Paul from Chicago's Red Storm and Rising. Cold War Conflict, 1980. NATO Doctrine and the Anticipated Outcome, the conventional GAUIK GAP conflict. And then we have, well, not many votes coming through. Oh, six on Danny Wright's Italian Forces and Infrastructure Red Sea. And if we carry on going down, oh, we've got Carl Hanshaw, the RN keeps control of the fleet air arm. How would that have changed the RN operations in Model 2? Probably a lot more powerful engines available. Probably a lot more powerful engines. Because the Royal Navy were power speed demons, so they would have kept pushing engine power as fast and as hard as they could. Uh, and then Italian Navy commissions its carrier in 41. How would a clash between two fleets have played out? That could have actually been really interesting, because that would have been a very balanced fleet action, but there would have been a lot of land-based aviation involved as well from the Italian side. Um, there's one day left. The boat ends tomorrow at, um, I think, 7.30, and that, uh, well, what I would call 19.30 hours in the UK, UK time, so I'm not sure what time that is with you watching this, but if you want to go and choose which of the two topics of all the patron suggestions done this month, you have to go vote, um, because, well, yeah. And remember, you can vote for as many as you like. I do not do a limit on the things of you can vote for all the ones that interest you, and the the rule is the two with the most votes get made. If a lot tie for second place, normally I would go right then. I'll try and figure out a way to do all of them. This month, with what I've got coming up next month and the month after that, uh, I probably won't be able to do that. Because honestly, I probably will be a little bit overwhelmed if I try to do that. So I will pick one probably. Pick whichever one I fancy the most. But, yeah. Let's go back to what today's topic is. And I will put, a, hopefully, a little click in here that says, go to five minutes if you want to see the video for just the topic. 
So, as always, we have the HR Scorpion, and we have the Shameless Book Plug. Yes, second edition on way. Woohoo! It's actually been recorded today, so this should actually read Saturday, the eighth of uh, the eighth of April. But yeah, these videos have been a lot of fun to put together. They really have been. So this is a picture of Scorpion herself, uh, representing her class. She is still in Den Helder, Netherlands. Uh, you can go and see her. She's in the museum. And she's a rather good-looking vessel. She's a combination monitor and steam ram. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, she has a pointed ram bow, and she also has a monitor-like turret. So she sub basically sub theoretically combines two ideas, the two great ideas which are coming through in terms of naval forces at the time. She is this capability which theoretically can strike any enemy down because either her guns can smash you into submission or she can ram you into submission. It's a great idea in theory. In practice I'm not too sure about it and I would say the fact that she's laid down in August 1867, launched in January 1868. She's actually built herself, as I just said, it's built in the UK, but she herself is built at Forges at Chantiers de la Madrenne in uh, Le seine sur mer i.e. France. So there's slight differences between the sizes because, of course, no French yard would ever build the same size and shape ship as another French yard, let alone as the British yard. The, the plans come through and the yards go, ah! These are optional guidelines. What are you up to, Fluff? These are rough shape stylings. But she's a very beautiful ship still. And the fact is... She is pretty darn capable. She is pretty darn capable. There's a small trail destruction going over there. There are spray paint cans and everything going everywhere so if you hear weird noises that's what's going on but no the scorpion class are another class which comes to an extent out of well out of the american civil war you know it's this this whole sort of knowledge and idea of these things and what they're going to build and how they're going to be built is coming out of what we can do, what is working well in the American Civil War. It's a classic example of you haven't had a real peer-on-peer -peer conflict in a very long time, and the moment you have one, the pace of technology suddenly everyone's going, oh, we need what they have there. Because real peer-on-peer -peer conflicts are rare. You know, if we consider the impact of the Falklands War in 1982, that was colossal. Why? Because it was the closest thing to a peer-on-peer -peer conflict that anyone had really had in about 20 years, especially in naval terms, probably about 30 or 40 years. One of the reasons why submarines are so dominant today, people always go, oh, it's due to World War II experience. No, it's not. Falcon's War. You look at what happens to the Argentine Navy, who has a very limited anti-submarine warfare capability, when the Royal Navy is doing around them with nuclear submarines. The, the Argentine Navy is options are come out and sink or stay home. They stay home. For the British, that's great. Yes, there is still a massive air threat going on. But you no longer have to deal with the level of axis of threat that could be generated by a carrier battle group coming out to play or Argentine warships coming in from different ve different differing vectors you change the threat paradigm greatly when you reduce down the potential sources of threats and it's the same in the American Civil War and that war, what's the famous fight? The famous fight is between the Virginia 
and a monitor. And everyone wants their own equivalents. But there, these ironclad monitors, well, these are built. This is actually Scorpion's sister ship destroying off. They are built with the ability to ram. Hence they're built like this. They have very, very strong armor. Very capable uh, guns. They have a Coles type gun turret with a pair of Armstrong 9 inch rifled muzzle loading guns. Now, you can guess what I'm going to say here because you can really see this. If you consider the size of the turret and all these things, and the sheer amount of space it takes up in vis a vis its guns. You can see where the pace of technology is really coming from. Because if you have a whole deck to play with and you can run things in and run things out, muzzle loading makes sense. It's very efficient, very capable. Yeah, it works on those scenarios. The moment you're doing inside a turret, that's when you start to get the push for breach loading. That's when breach loading starts to become really attractive. Because space. It's always the thing we we go aboard a ship, we see the size of it, and this the Scorpion is the la largest vessel in the Naval Museum she's currently in. You go along and you think, wow, this is a really big ship. And then you start to think about hang on, what happens in terms of space inside the turret? Things start to become very, very tight, very quickly. This ship is big and capable for its time. It's powerful, as I said several times. It could do a maximum speed of 12 knots, or a, you know, a thousand nautical miles at 10 knots. They have two propellers, two shafts. Driven by two steam engines, supplied by four boilers. It displaces over 2,000 tons. Has a length very nearly of 60 meters. A beam of nearly 12 meters. And a draft of nearly 5 meters. It's got a belt of armor which is between 3 and 6 inches thick, depending on what we're talking about. The turrets have 8 to 11 inches of armor on them. The deck has 3 quarters to an inch of armor on it. And the conning tower has 5.7 inches of armor on it. These are ships which are incredibly capable and incredibly potent. And they are also incredibly perfect for what the Dutch need them for. The Dutch are still an imperial power. But unlike Spain, they're not quickly taken advantage of. If we consider what happens to Spain... in the Spanish-American War. Surely the Dutch should have been just as right for conquest. Surely the Dutch should have been just as viable. After all, Spain's bigger than the Netherlands. Yet it wasn't. Why? Because the Dutch Navy was building ships like this in the 1860s and was still building equivalently capable ships later. The Dutch ships were built with the best technology and the best capabilities of their time and were crewed and supplied as such. At no point did the Dutch go, you know what? We can ignore our security. Maybe it's because they've been invaded so many times and they've had to fight for their lives so often. Maybe it's because, for them, their empire was literally the 
considered in terms of the mercant uh, the mercantile economics of the time what well, the mercantilist economics of the time um if we wanted to go for the actual system it was considered the actual lifeblood of Netherlands. Either way, they build these ships. And they're about national security, but also about imperial security. The fact is that during her entire career, um, Scorpion herself is actually, it doesn't actually ram any ship, but she is rammed in 1886. Uh, she's refloated, then stricken in 1906. You know, she has a interesting career. Her sister her sister is does not have such a fun time. Her sister is uh, sunk as a uh, aircraft target in 1925 after being stricken in 1908. But hey-ho. There whole armor belt, of course, is wrought iron, because that's the capability they have at the time. So, it's basically an improved version of what HMS Warrior has. But one of the reasons why HMS Warrior stays as effective as she is, for as long as she is, is because, well, as long as she does, is because the quality of armor doesn't improve for a, while, a long time. So you can just mount better guns, but really you aren't going to get much better armor than the shit than if she already carries with the iron back by Teak. So she goes from the uh, the capital ship role to the cruiser role to various other functions. Now, that's because of metallurgical science. And this is another area where the Dutch keep investing in. They keep investing in research and technology. So these ships... One of the interesting things about them is they have incredibly well-maintained engines. And they really do work well for them. Now, at a certain point, they also end up with a 28 centimeter, or rather 280 millimeter, breech-loading gun being fitted instead of the 9-inch guns. Now, this was considered a far better weapon to fit on them than the original muzzle-loading weapons. Now, it's, it's a fairly decent gun, but it does change their shape because it turns them from being a twin-gun turret to, I think most of them are single guns. They did try out a twin-gun, but I don't think it ever actually got fitted onto the ram and both ram the ram ironclads. I think they both got single gun mounts. But there is a bit of confusion. Later in life, after she's been stricken, well, Scorpion goes and becomes this. An accommodation ship. This is what she's trained into in 1906. And she stays it. Uh, she stays uh, even serving as a lodging and storing ship for the German ships, for the Germans, and German submarine crews, uh, during World War II. Because she's still there, still, folks, still being able to be used. In 1947, she was found in Hamburg and towed back to Dernhelder. Again, used as a lodging ship, and... This time, she became the barracks for the Dutch Wrens. Yes, the Women's Royal Naval Dust Service of the Netherlands. She was their barrack ship. She actually only decommissions, therefore, officially in 1982. When, thankfully, she was bought by a private foundation that managed to first set up as a floating museum in Middleburg. Then in 1989, she is finally opened to visitors as a museum ship. Now, it took about seven years to refit her and return her to the state she is in, sort of now. However, they don't seem to have it for long. 
I'm not sure what happens. There's an interesting story I'm sure about the museum and its storing and supporting of her because in 1995 the Royal Netherlands Navy reacquired a ship and they transfer her to the supervision of the Dutch Naval Museum in Dan Helder. Again, in May 2000, she went for a fur. Uh, she had gone for a. F uh, she opens again after a further 18 months of restoration, and um, that's where she is now, as far as I know. I think she has had some more maintenance done since May 2000, but you can go see her. She is still around, and she's a beautiful example of what kind of engineering was going on in the 1860s. Honestly, you need to see Warrior and her in the, in the space of a couple of days to get a real idea of how quickly the world is changing. What would be great is if you could have the USS Monitor there as well and, you know, really jump between the two, maybe the Virginia, and sort of go for all three, uh, all four sort of, sort of ships and wander through them, but you can't. But you can jump from Warrior and you can, I think in Portsmouth, you can possibly not go far to get a flight, but I think you can get a ferry from Portsmouth that gets you to uh, gets you to the Netherlands. I haven't done it. So you're not usually where I get ferries from in the UK, but I think you can possibly get one. I'd have to look it up and check. But you can go and then go see her. And it's a great, great thing to do. I did actually do it once. It was through luck rather than aiming, etc. I'd been at Portsmouth one day for one thing and then I had to be in Netherlands the next day and oh I wandered up and saw her and went you're cute and then I realized remember what she was where she was and I'm going goodness me the world changed we're talking less than a decade the world went from HMS Warrior is the pinnacle of ironclad technology to... This is a monitor. Oh, and by the way, they build even bigger ships. And some of those bigger ships are going to be part of this series at certain points. When I've got more time, I think I'm I'm tempted by Prince Hendrik de Nederland. And I'm also tempted by Koenig de Nederland. Uh, I think they're both kind of cool-looking vessels. And they have a very cool-looking history. But it's going to be working out when and how I can put it together. So, I hope you enjoyed her. Huh? I hope you found it interesting. She didn't really get to see much action, but that was the point for the Dutch, uh, for the Dutch Navy. They were about the Terence, and this is the point when you're sort of looking at things like the Spanish-American War. The Spanish, in theory, should not have been the weakest power. And if you look at the territories the Dutch have, they're in the similar areas. Yeah, there are Spanish territories in South America, etc., and in the Caribbean and these sort of areas which America is particularly interested in, but America is also quite interested in Southeast Asia. And the Dutch also have territories in the Caribbean. Yet America didn't even consider making a move against the Dutch. Because of ships like this, because of the legacy of ships like this, of the, of the Dutch investing in the equivalents, always having ships which were in service, capable, and could cause a lot of damage. The thing is, at no point once the Americans start really building up the naval force were the Dutch ever going to probably win a war against the Americans. But the thing is, the chances of a disturbing upset which would look bad in the papers and possibly cause governments to have nasty questions asked in Congress and the Senate was far greater when facing Gaff against the Dutch than it was the Spanish. It's their role in history. Menace. Right then. So, what have we got coming up? 
This is the up-to-date version of April. I did do have some come up which were the wrong dates around. I managed to get my Sundays and Thursdays mixed up on some videos and I hadn't updated it yet, but now this is up to date. And again, I am away on the 30th of April, so there will be more key ships coming out. So there are going to be key ships coming out Friday, April, because I basically decided the Friday videos, I'm doing a series of 10, so the Friday videos and Sunday the 30th of April are all going to be key ships. I hope you're going to enjoy them. There are more coming. And what else do we have? Next week, we have Justifying a Navy to a Continent, Alfred Taylor Mahan. I think you'll enjoy that. Take care, and have a nice day. Toodles. And quickly before I go, thank you for all your support. It really does make a huge difference, trust me.